Today on the show, we have the House of Mouse headlines brought to you by LaughingPlace.com, your up-to-date resource for the latest Disney news every day of the week. This episode is being released on November 15th, 2023, and here's what's been going on in the world of Disney recently. Pin trading makes a comeback at Walt Disney World, Disney Plus and Hulu are joining together, a phantasmic return date, and more. Hear the latest news from the Walt Disney Company in today's House of Mouse headlines. Downtown Disney is set to celebrate the holiday season with a magical nightly snowfall. Quote unquote, snow is scheduled to fall in the district nightly every half hour from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. between Jazz Kitchen Coastal Grill and Patio and Black Tap Craft Burgers and Shakes. These snowfall moments will begin on November 24th and continue through December 31st. Of course, you can also catch snowfall moments in Disneyland Park itself. After multiple delays, it's been announced that Disneyland's Fantasmic will return on May 24th, 2024. However, at this time, there aren't any new details about what the show will feature in the absence of the dragon. As you'll surely recall, the Maleficent dragon caught fire during a performance in April of this year, leading to the show's closure. Disney has previously said that the dragon will not be included when the show comes back. But with a date now set, hopefully we'll hear more about what's planned for the show as May approaches. With The Marvels now in theaters, which is a thing I'm once again allowed to say, Monica Rambeau and Kamala Khan, aka Ms. Marvel, are currently greeting guests at Avengers Campus in Disney California Adventure. The pair joined Captain Marvel in the area and have been spotted both as a duo and a trio at times. While Ms. Marvel has previously appeared at Avengers Campus in California, the hero now sports a new costume. Plus, Kamala has made her debut in Disneyland Paris at their campus in celebration of the new film. As for Monica Rambeau, this marks her park's debut. You can currently meet these marvelous characters for a limited time. This past weekend, guests visiting Disneyland were treated to a special surprise that was perhaps a wish come true. On Saturday night, Ariana DeBose, who voices Asha in the upcoming film Wish, performed the song This Wish in front of Sleeping Beauty Castle. The track is one of several songs that have already been released ahead of the film's theatrical debut. You can check out video of this surprise performance over on Laughing Place's YouTube channel, and you can see Wish in theaters on November 22nd. Guests at Walt Disney World can now meet Asha, the star of Wish. The character can be found at Epcot and the World Showcase Friendship Ambassador Gazebo. Meanwhile, Asha will also be arriving at the Disneyland Resort on November 22nd and at Disneyland Paris on November 29th. More fun from Wish is also headed to Epcot as a new Spaceship Earth light show inspired by the film is on the way. Starting on November 22nd, a show featuring the song I'm a Star, sung by the cast of the film, will join the rotation of segments shown on the park's icon. I'm a Star was the fourth Wish Wednesday song revealed and is now available to stream. Buried in a press release about holiday-themed content coming to or already available on Disney+, Plus, it was revealed that the next season of a Marvel series is also due out soon. A second season of Marvel's What If will premiere this holiday season, although no specific release date was given. Previously, a quick peek at Season 2 was teased during a 2022 San Diego Comic-Con panel. Marvel has also shared a look at the new character Kahori, who will make her debut in an episode, which will see the Tesseract fall to Earth and land in the sovereign Haudenosaunee Confederacy before the colonization of America. Season 2 of Marvel's What If will oddly arrive amid the holiday fair sometime in the next couple of months. The latest Indiana Jones film has set a Disney Plus premiere date. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny will become available for streaming on the platform beginning December 1st. Just a few days later, on December 5th, the film will also be available on Blu-ray and DVD, complete with a plethora of bonus features. Additionally, the film is currently available for purchase digitally. If you missed Indy in the theaters this summer, then buckle up for another ride on Disney Plus next month. After reviving the Fox direct-to-DVD Comedy Central animated series Futurama earlier this year, Hulu has now renewed the series for two more seasons, adding to the season that was already ordered. These extra two seasons will amount to an additional 20 episodes and will mark seasons 13 and 14 for the show. 
Season 11 debuted this summer, while season 12 is expected to debut on Hulu in 2024. Last week, Disney and Pixar released a new teaser trailer for the upcoming film, Inside Out 2. It seems that the short look at the sequel was a hit as it managed to become the biggest animated trailer launch in Walt Disney Company history, garnering more than 157 million views in 24 hours. However, the clip also confirmed some changes to the voice cast for this installment versus the original. Bill Hader and Mindy Kaling, who played Fear and Disgust respectively in the 2015 film, have been replaced by Tony Hale and Liza LaPira for this project. Nevertheless, Amy Poehler returns as Joy, along with Phyllis Smith as Sadness and Louis Black as Anger. Additionally, Mae Hawk joins the cast as Anxiety, whom we meet in the new teaser trailer. Inside Out 2 is set to hit theaters on June 14th, 2024. Alaska Airlines has debuted another colorful, Disneyland-themed livery to their fleet, this one celebrating Mickey's Toontown. After the big reveal of this specially-themed plane at a gate ceremony in Seattle, passengers boarded the inaugural flight to Orange County, California, to visit the happiest place on Earth. Named Mickey's Toontown Express, the celebrated plane is now flying on routes across Alaska's network and is the eighth livery the airline has done in collaboration with Disney. The plane features playful images of Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse, along with their pals Goofy, Pluto, Donald Duck, and Daisy Duck in Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland Park. You can actually follow the Boeing 737-800 by tracking tail number 565AS. Another collection of Disney Happy Meal toys has arrived at McDonald's, and it's a big one. In celebration of Disney 100, the fast food chain is currently offering 62 different toys depicting Disney, Pixar, Marvel, and Star Wars favorites. Plus, four characters from Wish are featured in the lineup. Each Happy Meal includes two characters for a total of 31 sets. You can collect all these toys, or at least attempt to, by visiting your local McDonald's for a limited time and watching while supplies last. And now it's time to bring back Kyle Burbank from LaughingPlace.com. How's it going, Kyle? It's good. I'm home for the first time in a few weeks, so it's very nice. For the first time in forever? Sure. All right. Now that we can talk about that movie called Frozen, yeah. Yeah, and you know what? That's the only reason I have this first story here today, because simply we can talk about it. We're allowed to. <laughs> Folks, the sag after strike has ended. Contract hasn't officially been signed yet. We have not voted for it, but it, it looks like, you know, we, we got what we needed. Of course, there's always compromise. The, neither side gets exactly what they want, but it sounds like sag after a really one out here which is fantastic because i'll always side with uh the artists versus the corporate studios so good news but even better news for you listeners who probably really don't care about the behind the scenes stuff we can talk about movies we can talk about tv we can talk about streaming so here we go because disney has moved a number of 2024 and 2025 release dates around now, we know that the release date for the third Deadpool film has been moved from May 3rd, 2024 to July 6th, 2024, uh, and filming of Deadpool 3 is set to resume after Thanksgiving, following the end of the SAG after strike. Captain America Brave New World sees a bigger change moving from July 6th, 2024 to February 14th, 2025, the perfect Valentine's movie, right? <laughs> I've always thought so. Additionally, the Barry Jenkins-directed Mufasa, the Lion King prequel, is shifting from December 20th, 2024 from July 5th, 2024, while Marvel's Thunderbolts moves to July 25th, 2025 from December 20th, 2024. And finally, Blade, which was slated to be released on February 14th, 2025, even more Valentine-y, <laughs> moves to November 7th, 2025. And the studio has also canceled plans for two other dates, July 25th, 2025, and November 7th, 2025, originally reserved for untitled films. These changes come after Disney pushed back the release dates of the live-action Snow White and Pixar's Elio, each by a year. Now listen, that's a lot of information. The overall gist, movies are being shuffled because of the strike. Some stuff, you know, that was supposed to be in production wasn't able to go into production. And 
you know, this costs the studios a ton of money. So they should have just made some agreements sooner is what it really comes down to. But uh, they didn't. So there were. I don't know. It, they moved it back a couple of months. Uh, but no, there. So it's also kind of an effort to space out Marvel specifically with they've been doing it with the tv shows and they're gonna do it with the movies more uh because we saw the last marvel movie didn't do so so hot so so one came out this past weekend right captain marvel uh, was it a marvel s- the marvels is what the marvels called. sorry it, but is captain marvel a, a character in the marvels she is yeah she's okay. the only one that if you didn't see the tv shows you know who she is okay <laughs> but uh the other two came from disney plus series which, you know, there's been some crossover before, but this, I feel, was like, if you didn't watch the Disney Plus shows, and specifically WandaVision and Ms. Marvel, then you had no idea who these characters were, and it doesn't really do much to uh, to tell you who they are, other than the very base level. So I think that's a factor. I don't think it's just, uh, you know, superhero fatigue and stuff, but what do I know? Yeah, so MCU stuff. We're going to be talking a bit more about that later on. Just curious, though, with any of those dates moving around, does any of that, like, disappoint you? Was there anything you were really looking forward to that you're like, oh, man, I got to wait longer? Probably the the Captain America and the Thunderbolts movies are probably the ones I'm looking most forward to out of those. Deadpool's also... Deadpool's the most interesting just because of, you know, it was a Fox movie. Now it's going to be in the MCU. As far as we know, um, <laughs> there's another thing we'll talk about later. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's just kind of interesting to see how they do that and how integrated it actually is. But otherwise, like, there's things I like about Deadpool, but it's not my favorite. It's, it's still like a little too much for me at times. Yeah. Very cool. Excellent. Well, let's move on because Marvel has revealed a new banner called Marvel Spotlight, which will focus on more grounded stories that don't necessarily connect to the larger Marvel Cinematic Universe, known as the MCU. Echo will be the first project released under the Spotlight banner. Marvel Spotlight is rooted in Marvel Comics' 85-year publishing history as Spotlight was an anthology comic series introduced in 1971 and saw the debut of characters like Ghost Rider and Spider-Woman. The idea was that comic readers didn't need to read every other comic that came prior and could simply pick up this issue and enjoy a self-contained story. What a novel idea. (laughs) That concept now extends into the MCU as fans will not have to have seen all of the Marvel Studios films and series to enjoy projects released under the Spotlight banner. However, it is odd that Echo is the first project released under this banner, given that we've already been introduced to the character in Marvel's Disney Plus series, Hawkeye. We also know the series will include both Matt Murdock, Daredevil, and Wilson Fisk, Kingpin, two characters who have both appeared in the MCU previously and will again in Daredevil Born Again. So it appears that projects under the spotlight banner will still have at least some connection to the MCU. I love how, like, they create this banner and immediately contradict themselves. <laughs> it's yeah, so that's, weird. Well, the other part of this is that this is going to be the first MCU show, well, I guess it's MCU adjacent show <laughs> that's going to be it's TVMA. So this is going to be on Disney Plus and Hulu. It's definitely on the uh, more violent end of things it seems. So I think that's kind of notable and by saying that it's um more grounded and not necessarily connected to the MCU. I'm like is that true or is it just that you want to have like a more mature subsect. And that's where I think of Deadpool. It's like, well, that one's not more grounded. And like the, the reason that this movie is like the, the Deadpool three is so hype is because it's going to be part of the MCU. But I wonder what we see. Like, I wonder how they ultimately use this spotlight banner. Like you're saying, it's a good idea, like having these sort of like standalone things, but only if they actually use it that way. So it, it does feel like a, Everything they're doing with Echo is weird. It's only five episodes. Um, they pushed it back to January. They're dropping it all at once, and it's TVMA. And then now there's a new banner for it. So I don't know what to think. I mean, it sounds like they recognize that they need to do something to, quote unquote, fix things at Marvel. Because let's face it, the reality is it's having a moment and kind of like, I'm curious to get your opinion on this. Everybody knows I'm not a superhero guy, really. But You know, there's always like the Walt Disney Animation and Pixar sort of thing where it seems like one of them is doing really, really well and the other one falters a bit. 
And I'm curious, like, is this that moment for Marvel? Like, is DC going to start eclipsing Marvel stuff? Which, like, really hasn't happened ever <laughs> since the whole superhero boom, it seems like. I mean, it, it's I guess it's possible they do have new blood there, but they, I mean, they're still going through their other, they're still, you know, <laughs> having to go through it. They just had, you know, Flash, which was really badly received in terms of box office. Um, Batgirl was completely shelved. And, you know, we had a little bit of influence. Oh, Blue Beetle, too, also just forgot all about it. But, you know, James Gunn and uh, the other guy haven't really had their their stuff hasn't come out yet. So I yeah. think it's possible once it does. But, you know, as an MCU fan, I don't, uh, I, I'm not really that worried. Like, I like having a bunch of content, but at the same time, it is kind of crazy to look back and be like, oh, wow, we're already not only through phase four, but well into phase five at this point, whereas the first phase took us however many years. Um, so I don't mind spacing it out, but I'm also not like, I know people get the the big catchphrase is superhero fatigue. And yeah, I can see similarities in this movie. I can poke things, but I, I'm so invested in the larger thing. And, and, you know, I still get giddy about all of these possibilities that if there's a, you know, a chapter in the book that I don't care for as much as the previous chapter, I'm not going to stop reading it. That's kind of where I'm at. I do get the fatigue thing unrelated to superhero stuff like but like i remember you know as a horror fan there was a period where every halloween a new saw movie came out mm -hmm. and it does and get it was paranormal activity after that yeah and it's just it does get to a point for me anyway that i'm like yeah like these feel like they're being rushed out they feel like they're money grabs and i eventually do give up on them even when it's a genre i'm interested in so i totally get the fatigue thing and i do personally agree with it the thing i find interesting is as a like a I don't want to say OCD, but like as somebody who, as a completionist, I will say that like having a movie that is quote unquote advertised as you don't need to know all of the MCU in order to enjoy this thing individually, I find appealing because mm -hmm. I am such a completionist that like that's part of the reason I don't get into the MCU is because I just I don't want to have to watch that much content and I would feel like I was missing pieces if I didn't. So I pretty much avoid it altogether for the 90%. So yeah, I, I do get that, but I don't think most people are like me. I think most people don't care and they'll pick and choose and do what they want and be fine with that. Or they'll see everything, you know, it's they're They're like willing to put in the time for every single one of those films. That's not me, but I do like the idea of standalone stuff. It does, but it does really frustrate me that this banner is already like wavering from their mission. <laughs> yeah, I think they can get back to it though. I mean, I think it's interesting what they did with Werewolf by Night, which is a complete like left field thing, and continues to stand on its own. Um, so if they can do that, yeah. All right, let's move on as Disney has. Finish their battle with SAG AFTRA. Let's start a new one because 63 production employees, including production coordinators, production managers, and production supervisors with Walt Disney Animation Studios, have voted to unionize. They voted to join the Animation Guild in a National Labor Relations Board ballot count. There were 68 voters total, and only five workers voted against it. If neither of the parties file an objection to the result within five days, they will be certified, and labor and management can begin bargaining the first contract. This comes after some legal concerns over whether certain members of this group were eligible to join the union. And so basically, listen, more pain in the butt stuff for <laughs> the Walt Disney Corporation to deal with. Uh, in these cases, I, you know, tend to side with the individual over the corporation. I mean, Disney and unions has kind of has a long history. Even Walt, you know, had to fight this with the animators, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how this works out. My guess is they're going to unionize is my my guess. That's probably how it's going to end. But man, what a pain in the butt. I wouldn't want to be CEO of the Walt Disney Company. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, you're not. I am not. And right now, I feel like Mr. Iger probably doesn't want to be either. <laughs> At least he gets a big fat paycheck for it, right? Yep. 
All right, let's move on then. Insider is reporting that Walt Disney World is cracking down on those who operate or are employed by unofficial and third-party tour services that operate at the resort. The Insider report mentions that they spoke with nine third-party business owners and tour guides, five of which had received trespass notices, barring them from Walt Disney World property. Some of these businesses have been in place for for many years, uh, one almost 30 years. While the report shares stories that the unauthorized tour guides want to sit and work with Disney, especially considering these tours are their only source of income, it should be noted that a third-party unofficial tour guide has never been permitted at Walt Disney World. You know, this is one of those things that, like, I I actually, (laughs) I'm going to contradict myself, I actually side with Disney on this one. I mean, it's (laughs) it's their property, and I get it. I would be annoyed, but I guess the, the real thing here is it's, the theory anyway, is that these groups are taking advantage of the the disability system, right? And not all of. I don't think that's general, but yeah, I think if in looking in the article, I, I there was a few people that are like, hey, we do everything by the book. We do know that there's other people, other services that do take advantage of these loopholes, but we don't do that. So it kind of feels like a baby with the bathwater sort of a situation. Yeah, it's one of those things where I'm like, I, I do think it would be smart for Disney to sit down with them and try to work something out but at the same time i think you know disney clearly has every right to say no you can't do this at all you know disney charges five and six times as much money for their vip tours and this is obviously has lesser to offer because you know they disney can do what they want they're right they can cut lines they can do all that sort of stuff and give these special vip services that these groups can't do but I don't know. Where do you stand? Have you ever done one of these? I've never uh, even a considered third party tour. It. Yeah, no, I never have. Um, but I am old enough to remember there was um, someone in the community a long time ago that would do these third party uh, history tours at Disneyland, and was once trespassed for it. I think after a, a misunderstanding where somebody joined his tour thinking that it was the official one, and that's how Disney kind of fought out and had to crack down on it. But that was like a long time ago. So uh, it's kind of interesting that this has come back around. So yeah, we'll see what comes of it. It just sounds like, you know, it's one of those things where you do it until you get caught. And let's face it, they were probably caught a long time ago. Disney isn't stupid. They know that these things exist. It's just you push, you push, you push. You get to a point where you're like, okay, no more of this. And they crank down. So sounds like it's going to go away. I hope that... You know, obviously, if this is your entire business, that's a problem. You need to make a hard, hard pivot. But I don't start know how selling knockoff ears, right? Or you, you start <laughs> giving tours at Universal or something, I guess, or Sea World, because the days of the Disney are done. Plus, like these people who are banned, these are like lifetime bans. I guess you can appeal it in like a year or something like that. Yeah, I think that's what the article said. Is technically it's a lifetime, but you can appeal and. You know, I, I think on the individual level, I think they'll be able to, to – I don't think they're going to be able to restart their business, but hopefully they'll be able to visit themselves. Because, you know, it is unfortunate. Like, if you're like, everybody – there's all these people doing it. Clearly, they're, they're, Disney must be okay with it. Like you're saying, they're not stupid. They know that it's been happening. And if somebody has a business for 30 years and you look at them, you're like, well, that must be okay then. I have can put my own spin on this and then to kind of just have it blow up. It, You know, I do – sympathize uh but yeah at the same time it is disney's right and who knows why they made this decision and they're sure as heck not going to tell us <laughs> i wonder which came first like the official vip tours or outsiders doing tours and disney seeing that and being like hey let's do it because it kind of well, reminds me of like the vip tours like I, I think there's a difference between you know that the vip style i should tour. say private tour That's fair. But uh, yeah, the VIP tour, like you're saying, the ones that would, um, these apparent bad apples that are teaching people to misuse the disability pass, that does seem like a, you know, a VIP style tour to try to help you save time in line. Whereas I imagine there's other ones that are more just about, you know, showing you around and sharing like fun facts, that sort of thing. Yeah, like a a history tour sort of thing, which Disney offers as well. So I'd be curious to know which came first, Disney officially doing it or unofficial versions, because it just reminds me a little bit of like the Etsy wall kind of stuff that Disney Mm -hmm. has in their parks now where people were making this super niche kind of minimalist 
uh, merchandise online that was unofficial. And then one day Disney's like, hey, people like that. We're going to do that. And we're going to stop those other people who thought of this from doing it. So yeah. I don't know. I'd be curious to know. But in any case, let's move on, because since the reopening of the parks post-COVID closures, Disney pin trading hasn't been present at Walt Disney World. I was shocked to read this. Did you know this? I didn't know this either. I think there might have been, like, boards, but I guess the whole, like, lanyard thing yeah. hasn't been happening. And I, no, I was and also gobsmacked, if you will. And let's just remember that Walt Disney World reopened in 2020. They were only yeah. closed three or four months. I know it's easy to like think of the year and a half plus closure of Disneyland, but it was only like four months, I think, at Walt Disney World. So after three years, Disney pin trading with cast members is returning to the resort via a steady rollout. Starting now, guests will notice that Disney Springs cast members will once again be donning lanyards and presenting pin boards for trading. The rollout of this Disney tradition will continue throughout the resort in 2024. Shooketh. <laughs> yeah i again i had no idea that this wasn't happening uh i've never been a big pin trader i do have like you know a decent number of pins but uh I, it's cool that it's coming back i hope it's not as uh fervent as it was at times but it's walt disney world i feel well although i think probably walt disney world probably has a stronger ap fan base than than disneyland these days why do you say that I just feel like the whole magic -y thing uh, soured people and the pricing. But I feel like, I don't know, Dis Walt Disney World's, I've, it just feels like they are more, like a lot of people move to Florida, I guess, is what it comes down to. A lot of Disney fans live in Florida. I mean, well, RAPs sell out here. Uh, not the Florida ones, but the rest of them haven't been available. The ones that other people can buy. What are you talking about? So, like, it, most of the... Oh, you mean the tiers, Florida residents Florida, ones. When you said the Florida ones, I'm like, well, they're, they're all Florida ones. You mean the Florida <laughs> resident ones. Yeah, the, only, like, the top two tiers can be purchased by non-Floridians. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I don't know. Very interesting. We'll see what happens there. But pins are back. I'd be curious to see the spreadsheets and see how much money they lost not having pin trading. Like, <laughs> genuinely, I, I'm going to assume it was, like, you know, they're, it's back because it was a profitable thing. So I'd be curious what kind of business pins do these days. Very interesting. Anyway, Kyle, before we move on, I want to mention that this is the last live stream Ask Me Anything month of 2023. It's currently scheduled for November 30th, where I'll be hopping on a Zoom session with any current and new patrons of Disney Coast to Coast to talk about all things Disney and, frankly, anything you want to discuss. If you'd like to take part, find out how you can by starting with the lowest tier even over on the DCTC Patreon page. You can find the link in this episode's description, so check that out. Now, the Walt Disney Company announced that it will acquire the 33% stake in Hulu held by Comcast NBC Universal following Comcast's November 1st exercise to pull the arrangement between the two companies. The acquisition of Comcast's stake in Hulu at fair market value will further Disney's streaming objectives. While the timing of the appraisal process is uncertain, Disney anticipates it should be completed during the 2024 calendar year. Disney has had a small stake in Hulu for many years, but got 60% control when they acquired 20th Century Fox in 2019. Warner Media then sold their stake in Hulu back to the company, giving 67% to Disney and Comcast with 33%. So, why? What's what's going to take so long? Why is this going to happen during the twenty twenty four calendar year? I'm not understanding that. So, in the contract that they signed, there's a floor value. So Disney states what that floor value is, and I think is actually paying that up front. But Comcast obviously wants. They're going to say, "Oh no, Hulu's worth fifty billion," and Disney's yeah. going to be like, "No, no, it's worth twenty billion or whatever." So each of them have to hire a bank to do an assessment and appraisal of this of hulu and then if those are far off then they need to hire an independent third party that they agree to to figure it out so it's all about the valuation what disney is going to ultimately uh pay that's why it's gonna take a little bit longer so they can sort that out and what do you think is the long game plan here because i'm a little confused and it, i mean this kind of leads into the next story which we'll get into in a second but there's going to be a disney plus and hulu combined app sort of thing but like Disney wants Hulu. I feel like they streaming has been difficult for them. 
To me, it seems like sell Hulu. Get 100% of it so you can sell it and make a profit. It's kind of what it seems like to me. But then that contradicts this next story. Yeah. So I think what it comes down to is I don't know how, if they did sell it, what they're actually selling. Like if it's just the platform, absolutely. You don't need it. Just bundle it into to Disney Plus like you do with Star already outside of the United States. But I think there's got to be something about the content and they want that library. They've, you know, had some prestige success with Hulu and some other, you know, um, in terms of numbers with with a general audience uh, product on Hulu. So I don't know that they want to give that up. So even if they do end up moving the Hulu brand into Disney Plus physically, I think which sounds silly to talk about physical when it's all digital, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> Buy physical I, media. <laughs> I figure that's kind of what it came down to was that they wanted those those content assets and they do see value in the, the Hulu name, even if that's kind of questionable in my opinion. That's why it is so messy when companies just buy companies and buy more companies and more companies. Like, there is no line anymore. It is so confusing and so messy, frankly. Speaking of Hulu, and you were just saying you don't, it sounds like you don't really respect the brand name. Is that fair? Um, I just don't know how much it matters for Disney. Like, if mm-hmm. Disney just created a new word <laughs> at random and said, this is where all Hallow. of our, or how about this? touchstone uh if everything oh. was just under touchstone like i don't know how much of a difference you know is someone going to be up, oh well i don't i used to watch only murders in the building but now it's on touchstone so i can't do that anymore like i don't know anybody that's gonna to do that i will say they did a terrible promotion job with their huluween event here <laughs> in la they had a free haunt experience it was called huluween and i went through this haunt And it was one of the lamest things I've ever seen. Like, just lame. And even though it was free, I was still aggravated that I, like, got in my car and drove somewhere and dealt with parking and all that stuff to go to this really lame event. And I was like, well, I guess budget's budget. You can only do, you can't, you you know, but here's the thing. They spent budget on all the wrong things. I'm like, okay, this location was not cheap to rent. And then at the end, they gave everybody that went through a Huluween sweatshirt. I was wow. like, you're giving me a free sweatshirt? Why don't you make a better experience that I'm going to post about? You know, I'm not going to post a picture of me in the Huluween sweatshirt, but if you did a really awesome haunt, I, you know, I would have. And I don't know. It was just bizarre. So, yeah, Hulu, I mean, Hulu, uh, the brand's name is interesting and their marketing is interesting. And I don't think I watch anything specifically that's because it's like a Hulu thing. I guess only murders in the building, but who owns that? Is that a Disney show? I don't even know. I think it's produced by ABC Signature or Hulu or 20th Century Television, whichever All one right. of those. But yeah, I'm pretty sure that's a Disney produced show. Is that going to be uh, that show should just go under the new Marvel banner because it has nothing to do with the MC. <laughs> so that would fit, right? I guess so. And if it doesn't ha- necessarily fit the larger MCU, yeah. Yeah, Steve Martin is a superhero in my book. Although, I, <laughs> starring Steve Martin and Martin Short, I don't know why this hasn't become a thing. Those two have gone on tour together and done live shows together for so long. Why have they not had a show called Steve Martin Short? I don't know. They could just create like a whole, like create short films. Steve Martin Shorts. Steve Martin Shorts. There we go. Uh, I don't know. Steve Martin Short should be a thing. In any case, let's move on because a beta version related story, a beta version of the combined Disney Plus and Hulu app will launch in December. The December launch for users who have a Disney Bundle subscription will give parents time to set up parental controls. The one app experience will then launch on Disney Plus in late March 2024. Hulu favorites, including Only Murders in the Building, starring Steve Martin Short, The Bear, (laughs) Abbott Elementary, and Family Guy will be available on Disney Plus for bundle subscribers. Disney announced plans to launch a combined app during an earnings call in May 2023. Once again, I'm kind of just like, why? I I, I just, I don't understand streaming, I think is what it really comes down to. Buy physical Uh. media. Well, this is for people who are already bundled, so I think it does make sense to not have to leave the app. And like I said, this is something that they've already got experience with because outside of the United States, they have Star, which Mm -hmm. is their 
you know, general stuff. A lot of stuff that's on Hulu is on Star, and it's just another tile, as they call it in Disney Plus. But I think the challenge is, like they said, not everything that's on Hulu will be available in this tile version. And I am sure that that's because of however the the rights work with certain things. Like, especially, I think Fox shows that aren't so some Fox shows are still produced by Disney, like the cartoons, like Bob's Burgers and Family Guy. But then there's other Fox shows that air on Fox Network that are currently streaming on Hulu. I don't think those will come over, be accessible through Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Jeff is shaking his head for people listening. He's just so confused by this entire thing. It's not even confusion. It's just so disgustingly messy. It is so messy. Well, it's going to be messier because like, this is for bundle subscribers. And I finally am an actual bundle subscriber. But if you have a split account... Or if you have a, a legacy thing where you might have, you know, ads on Hulu, but ad-free Disney+, Plus, I can already tell you that there's no way in hell they're going to be able to figure that out to where, okay, you're watching this show, but you're watching the Hulu version, so I won't show you ad- – or I will show you ads, but if you watch it on the Disney Plus version, then it won't – it's not going to work. Can but- I be completely honest? I'm actually legitimately thinking of getting rid of Disney+, Plus because months pass where I don't watch it. I'd say – maybe four months out of the year i would watch it and i'm i'm at the point where number one i'm just disgusted with the way that it's being it's just so messy and there's not enough content to hold my interest that like i feel like a month could come along plus frankly life is busy and i don't watch a ton of tv not nearly as much as i used to so i feel like i could be like hey next month isn't an insane month for me I'll subscribe for a month and binge whatever it is I want to see at that moment. I don't need it every month of the year. I really don't. And so I'm legitimately thinking of getting rid of it. I don't know. But you just bundled, it sounds like. Well, yeah, we kind of reshuffled all of our subscriptions because, uh, well, several reasons. But it comes down to the fact that actually I have a credit card that gives me a $20 a month uh, credit. For such things and so having ad free hulu and have ad free disney plus just happens to be 19.99 a month so it worked out for me very nice and where can people learn other uh, savvy money tips like that kyle <laughs> uh, if you want to go to money at 30.com you can read i have a quick tip every friday i have some other stuff and then also i write for another site called fiany it's like finance and money combined f-i-o-n-e-y.com okay who came up with that name uh not me yeah that's worse than hulu (laughs) that's a terrible name but i'm sure your writing is fantastic so money at 30 is at 30.com or 30 yes 30.com and how old are you now uh 37 have we bought the domain for money at 40 yet i believe we have okay Uh, that's not my department but yeah all right perfect Excellent. Let's move on because it was announced that Disney 100, the exhibit, will arrive in Kansas City next May. Before we jump into this, I just have to laugh. My, I literally, the story, the news that people heard about already about the McDonald's Disney 100 Happy Meals, I had a hard time getting through that without like laughing the whole time. <laughs> because what was it, 62 toys for Disney 100 or something? I was like literally had a stupid grin on my face. I don't know if people could hear it the whole time, but my God, it was tough to get through. That aside, Disney 100, the exhibit, will arrive in Kansas City next May. Kyle, I believe you were on hand for this announcement, right? I was, yeah. I was driving back home and decided to make a pit stop in Kansas City uh, at the really beautiful uh, Union Station there in Kansas City. So, was actually a train station at one time. Now, it mostly just hosts like exhibits and things like that and has some dining um but yeah it's coming we knew it was going to be coming to kansas city now we have a little bit better idea of when it's going to be in may it also seems like this is going to be the one that's currently in london mm. um not 100 percent sure on that but it sounds like the one from london will be moving over because there's going to be one in chicago that just started or starting very soon so they'll be going on at the same time but yeah it's a cool little announcement um i haven't seen the exhibit i'm sure i'll go back to check it out when it does come to Kansas City, because it's only a few hours away and we have friends up there. Um, but yeah, it was a fun, fun announcement. Lots of inaccurate things were said that made me roll my eyes a bit. <laughs> Such uh, as? 
Um, well, some of them weren't on stage. Some of them were afterwards when the guy's giving a thing and said that Walt Disney created Mickey Mouse in Kansas City when he was 18 years old. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm just you got one part of that, which is Walt Disney created Mickey Mouse. <laughs> uh, let me ask you this. Was uh, was Becky Klein, head of archives, within eyesight uh, at that point? Because I would have been she staring was. at her and, and just like I would have been. Or is she clenching her fists? Is she rolling her eyes? Well, when the guy said Disneyland Tokyo, I, I look at her and then he, there's something else. I forget what. Oh, I think someone might have done the uh, if you can dream it, you can do it Walt Disney quote thing. Uh, I I looked for Becky to cringe then. But then, you know, Becky not entirely innocent either. At the They sang uh, Mickey Mouse Club, which was very fun. But then she said, see you in March. But the thing opens in, in May. <laughs> oh, Diff- no. Different M month. Well, listen, so. that's an error, you know. No, the, I know. That's I will say that the coffee they provided to us was very good. So if you're at Union Station in Kansas City, whatever the coffee shop there is, uh, I give that a thumbs up. It's Joffrey's. No, I it was not no, Joffrey's. I have no idea. <laughs> but it might. It was probably whatever the place was. They probably serve roastery, which is a big. Ro- <laughs> it's a roastery called the Roastery in Kansas City. But yeah, it was very good coffee. Cool. Do you think I would have raised my hand and corrected them? I don't think you would have because let me tell you this: the vibe of this announcement was very interesting. It felt the people that didn't work for Disney that were there. It felt very chamber of commerce Mm. like a lot of like local business owners so i was uh sticking out like a sore thumb with my blonde hair there (laughs) it was was Uh, fun though funny well very very cool and also plenty of uh, references to taylor swift and travis kelsey during during the presentation really why because it's kansas city and he plays for the chiefs and it was the hot story so they had to keep sneaking it in somehow Oh, that's the football guy, her her boyfriend. The football guy, yes. Okay. Uh, God, why do people care? It's so amazing to me. All right, cool. I'll be curious to see. I, I believe, I assume there will be more stops for this, you know, archives exhibition. I'll be curious to see if they keep the Disney 100 name. Because what, October 2024 is the, en- the official end of Disney 100 is... You know, basically a year from now. Disney 101. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a good name for the exhibit because then it's teaching you about Disney history. It's walking. It's a 101 class. So that's keep file that Copyright away. Copyright that. But yes, this Kansas City one is the last of the announced cities. So yeah, I think it'd be interesting. Well, it started in Philadelphia, which has no ties to <laughs> to Walt. And then it's ending in two cities that do have deep Walt ties, Chicago and Kansas City. You know what my dream is, right? No, but go for it. I'm I'm sure I've said it before. I really, 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 really would love for it to end and sit in Disney Springs in downtown Disney. I would love to take over the SPN zone, have it there. I would love for it to take That's over right, the, you did tell me that. the NBA place, whatever that was. Or, you don't want to you know, take over the Disney Gelson's West. on Hyperion? Gelson's? On, no. Oh, that would, <laughs> that would be interesting, wouldn't it? That's if for folks listening, that was the original location of the Hyperion studio for you know, Walt's original studio, and now it's a Gelson's grocery store. But to be fair, they do have a plaque in their parking lot recognizing it as a historic location. So there's that. But yeah, no, I would really, really love to see them exist at a Walt Disney Resort, like permanently with, you know, a section that rotates. I think that would be great, but we'll see. That'd be cool. Anyway, Kyle, that's it for the news, but there are a couple of things I just want to touch on real quickly that we weren't allowed to talk about because of the strike. Okay. I do want to mention, we had the final season of High School Musical to Musical the series on Disney+. And first of all, it makes me sad to like recognize that that is one of the oldest shows on Disney+. And it blows my mind that it's now been four years because I can like remember that yesterday. Expo. Four years yesterday, yes, from the date uh, we're recording this, the November 12th was four years. And I can remember watching that presentation at D23 Expo and like the energy for High School Musical, the musical, the series, and like really loving season one and season two being, eh, this probably should have been a mini series. This, you know, it's, it's fine, but it's not necessary. Season three, really just rolling my eyes constantly. And so when they announced season four, I was like, Let me just finish this as a completionist. I got to finish this. Delighted by season four. Like, really enjoyed it. They went back to their home roots. They, it was touching. Oh my gosh. Like, the final episode, first of all, sit through the credits of the final episode if you haven't. 
It's like really beautiful. And they touch on some subject matters that I wouldn't really expect a high school musical series to get into, like like cheating and stuff like that. I'm like, okay, this feels very like non-Disney Channel. So I don't know. I really was delighted by High School Musical, the musical, the series season, you know, our series finale. Nice. So just putting that out there. You've never seen a single episode, have you? No, but I, di- I did listen to Guts and I enjoy that record. So is that adjacent? I don't know. The Olivia Rodrigo album. Oh, oh yeah, yeah I don't care. She's she was one of my the least interesting uh, things on that show for me. Which I know, I I understand. You can quit yelling at me now uh, <laughs> as you're driving in your car or taking oh, a I shower. I know nothing of her acting. I just know her music. Yeah, people love her. I am mm, nah nah not for me. But that was, I will say, the one downfall. Is somebody even not particularly a fan? I thought it was a little disappointing she had like nothing to do with season four season three she had little to do with you know but whatever mm-hmm. it's fine really fun season so check it out if, you, if you've watched any of it if you gave up during season three because it was trash go back and revisit season four and miss jen oh my gosh miss jen i just want to hug her and love her as much as i can so there's that i also want to touch on elemental which I still have not seen, admittedly. Okay. That's not where I thought I was going. I, I had every intention of going to see it. It was it's been a busy couple of months. But in any case, Elemental I want to touch on because it was like a bomb there for a while. And everybody was talking about how this film is just like absolutely bombing. But it had quite a comeback because originally it arrived with a $29.6 million box office and domestic ticket sales in June. It was the worst opening in Pixar history by a mile. But then little by little, this $200 million film became a hit, collecting nearly $500 million worldwide. And I just love this like, cinderella story for elemental (laughs) you know yeah it even got a shout out during the most recent earnings call as you know being a success so it's yeah definitely a nice arc for that movie and it's good i watched it on disney plus i i think you'll enjoy it when you get around to it before you cancel disney plus you can watch it yeah i will watch it and i really wanted to see it on the big screen and i kept it's been on my list i've missed a ton of movies just out of busyness but yeah, I really do want to see it, and I'm very happy that it was that. And I, you know, this is just a good reminder. Like, just because the movie doesn't have a good opening weekend, there are so many factors. There could be weather in certain parts of the country dissuading people from going to movie theaters. There could be a, a certain competition during that opening weekend that affects it. There could be a life event going on. Like, movies should not and do not live and die by their opening weekend. So do not pull them so quickly. And studios, do not give up on them so quickly. I'm sure Papa Iger's listening, so uh, take the note, sir. Anyway, I also want to talk about a new movie, Wish, which I have not seen yet, but did you happen to see, they had the big premiere at the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Did you see some video of the drone show that they did? I did, because Laughing Place was there. Um, This was... Did Mike go? uh, No, uh, I, well... I don't know if he went in addition to our CEO, but our CEO was there, and I was like, "Hey, the that's when the the strike ended was that night at midnight," and he's like, "Oh yeah, so if uh, if that didn't happen, if it did happen earlier, we wouldn't have been invited because we're not that level where we get to go to uh, <laughs> um, premieres with stars usually. But if there's no stars, then I guess they have room for us. Uh, but yes, long story short, I did see the drone show." Very cool, right? Like Disney and drones. Let's get more of that. Uh, It looked great. Really want them in the parks. I've been hearing good things about Wish, to be honest. I haven't. I mean, I've seen a trailer here and there, but I haven't been following the new music. I haven't been paying too close attention to it, but I do expect to see it over the Thanksgiving weekend. That's always such a nice, sweet spot for, you know, Disney box office. And yeah, I hope it's I hope it's a new classic. I don't think full reviews are out yet. No. But the social reaction that I got from the people that uh, I know that saw it said they enjoyed the experience of seeing it, even if they weren't ready to process it as a movie, just because of how what a celebration it is of Disney animation in general. And actually, like, feel they said, like, it justifies the entire Disney 100 celebration, basically, by having this thing that references all these other movies. So they had a great time with it, even if 
I don't know if they thought of it as a movie on its own. Great. I'm happy to hear that people enjoyed it. How does it reference the other Disney movies? Apparently in a bunch of different ways. Like, I think if you watch the trailer, there's one that seems to be like an homage to Be Our Guest. Okay. Um, there's some like little dialogue things. Is this going to be like the old days where they would trace the old animation and I just mean, do the possible. same movements? <laughs> And, and now it's an homage. It's not just cheap. It's an homage. That's funny. Well, excellent. I'm glad people are liking it. I, is there anything you've seen that like during strike you wanted to mention but couldn't? I'm trying to think of anything that I saw that I couldn't. T- I do want to talk about one story related that we couldn't talk about. And that is the fact that Disney, there's been a couple Disney Plus shows. I think there's a couple more coming that have been released on Blu-ray, physical media of Disney Plus shows. Uh, It just seemed right up your alley, and I couldn't even talk about it with you, but they released Loki, um, the first season, on a Blu-ray collection. I don't remember if the WandaVision one is out, and then there's two Mandalorian. The first two seasons of Mandalorian are also coming. So, yeah, these steelbook with all sorts of, like, collector stuff in it, and not, not just slips of paper with download codes. They are actual discs. So, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, I hope, honestly, I think High School Musical, the musical, the series deserves a physical release. But to be fair, that skews a younger audience and younger audiences, I don't think, care about physical media. So probably not. But yeah, I'd love to know what like their, what the threshold is, like how many views. And I my guess is it's not just based on views. It's probably has to be like, okay, what's the demographic of the people that watches this as, as well? So it's interesting though, but yeah, I like I like to hear that. That's a good thing. That way, if they ever decide to pull it, guess what? You can still watch it if you bought those pieces of physical media. That's great. And then I think at the same time, I think some of the pulled stuff um, has resurfaced on digital download. So that was also an interesting development. Still not, I haven't seen Mysterious Benedict Society pop up yet, but that movie Crater that came out and was like, oh yeah, unceremoniously pulled like two months later. I think you can now download that on some uh, like iTunes and things like that. Anything about the Honey I Shrunk the Kids episode of Prop Culture? I haven't haven't seen anything on that front. I oh, haven't heard sad. anything about Shrunk re, uh, restarting up. All right. Well, I'm going to end this with a story that is. Disney adjacent, because I had a crazy experience recently that I must share. You might have seen some of this on social media. But first of all, is John Williams a Disney legend? Because he should be. I don't know. I don't believe he is. John Williams, arguably the greatest film composer of all time, now 91 or 92 years old, wrote the scores and those iconic themes for Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, E.T., Jaws... Harry Potter, so many amazing, 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 amazing film scores. So I had the opportunity to go to the Walt Disney Concert Hall and see E.T., which is one of my favorite films of all time. You were wondering what film it was? Yeah, Yeah, I I was like, Jurassic, maybe? (laughs) It wasn't Jurassic Park. So E.T., the extraterrestrial, made the uh, it was released the year I was born. It is one of my favorite films of all time. I love E.T. And Beginning to end, I can easily say that E.T., the extraterrestrial score, is my favorite movie score of all time. I'm not saying it's necessarily my favorite John Williams theme. Um, His themes are amazing. It's tough to pick a favorite one. But I always say, you know, even growing up, I listened to movie scores more than anything. The first cassette I ever bought was a John Williams Star Wars cassette, like the one I (laughs) bought with my own money. It was John Williams. Love John Williams. But E.T., you know, even if you love a movie, a lot of times when you're listening to a score or the tracks on a score, if you're not seeing the movie, they're a little lackluster. E.T., not that way. To me, beginning to end, it's a symphony. Love that score. Have I made it clear how much I love E.T. and how much I love the score to E.T.? Have I made that clear? And how much you love John Williams. Yes, all these things. I've made it clear. Great. So the idea of seeing the film on the big screen with a live orchestra, the L.A. Phil, one of the greatest orchestras in the world, playing the music live with Dudamel, Gustavo Dudamel, conducting in his, like, final year, I think. Is it this year or next year? Is his final year in L.A.? Thrilling. And I was riveted. I had chills running through my body the whole first half until intermission. And I was happy. But then, Act 2 is about to begin. And I kid you not... John Williams sat in the seat directly in front of me (laughs) and I died and I was with somebody who I was kind of cuddly with. I pushed him away and I was like, 
we got to get serious. And he, he was a little confused. He didn't exactly know what was going on. And I was like, I'll talk to you after. I'll explain later. <laughs> and I was just like, we need to be like on best behavior right now. And it was it was thrilling because obviously I st- – first of all, it's hard to watch an orchestra and a movie at the same time. Even harder to watch John Williams watching an orchestra in a movie at the same time. So I don't think I watched any of the second half of the movie because I was just watching him and I was dying. And I was just like, I just kept saying to myself, Jeff, live in the moment, live in the moment, live in the moment. Like I had to just take it in. And it was so fun to watch him react to the orchestra in the film. And unbelievable, Kyle. I could not believe, like I literally had to question, is this really happening? Unbelievable believable thrilling that's awesome yeah i saw your instagram story in the moment and i could sense your enthusiasm through the phone oh i'm living through it right now just thinking about it but oh god and what an, if you ever have the chance to see et with a live orchestra do it coming up next if anybody listening lives in la uh, in december they're doing home alone another brilliant john williams score uh, now a disney movie since the fox acquisition and by the way i'll just mention i've done a fantastic episode of disney coast to coast honestly one of my favorites with aaron wallace where we ranked all six home alone films so check that out if you haven't but i would love to see home alone with a live orchestra for years i always said it was like his most underrated score i do feel like in the last five years or so it's it's starting to like really get recognized as a brilliant John Williams score. I, I think it's phenomenal. And I wish I could see it, but it's like right before Christmas and I'll be on the East Coast at that point. So I won't be able to make it. All right, Kyle. So that was my crazy adventure. That was some updates on stuff we couldn't talk about during the strike. I am gra- First of all, thank you to you. Genuinely, thank you for rolling with the punches. I'm sure you didn't mind skipping stories altogether because that <laughs> meant less writing. But in the case of theme park stuff where you had to get creative with the way things were written, nicely done, sir. Thank you. Happy to Happy to support. Longest strike in SAG after history, or in SAG history, I should say, because SAG after is fairly new ish still. But in any case, new, yeah, it is. I guess the new ish, yes. I was still living in LA when that merger went through. So. SAG after the, the merger is less than 10 years, I believe. I think it's like seven or eight years. It's probably getting close to 10 years. Let me Google it right now. Hold on. A second. All right. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It was big doings when I was out there. When did SAG after a merge? Well, the weirdest thing for me was I had 2012. Ex- oh my God, March yeah. 30th, 2012. More than 10 years. Ooh, we're at 11 years. Holy crap, time flies. I haven't been a, I've been a SAG after a member for 11 years. I've been paying a lot of dues, I guess. Anywho, anything to add, Kyle? Only a couple more House of Mouse headlines until the end of the year. That's crazy. I know. Time's flying. And we got holiday episodes coming up. I hope you all enjoyed last week's episode with folks from Cirque du Soleil's Drawn to Life. That was a real joy to do. And anyway, we're wrapping up season 10 of Disney Coast to Coast. Jeez. Oh, my God. Is this show as old as almost the SAG as after? Long, uh, almost, yeah. It's two, two years. It was March or February of 2014. So about two years lesser. Anywho, Kyle, that's going to do it for this week's episode. I'll talk to you again in a couple of weeks. Have a good one, sir. You too. Bye. To read more about any and all of the stories you've heard here today, simply visit the show notes link in this episode's description. You've heard the news, and now I want to hear what you have to say about it. What do you think will replace the Maleficent dragon in Fantasmic when it returns next year? Share your thoughts on that or any other topics mentioned in today's episode. Call 818-860-2569, and you may just hear yourself on a future episode of Disney Coast to Coast. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Don't miss any future episodes by subscribing and following Disney with a Z, Coast to Coast, on your favorite podcast app, where episodes are available 24-7. Until next time, anything you need can be found in this episode's description. From additional information and links discussed in this episode found in the show notes, contact info to reach me, access to the show's official website, some free gifts from me to you, and so much more. So be sure to check out this episode's description. Other than that, folks, have a magical day. Bye!